almost entire spinal canal in the region of the cord equina and the diagnosis in this case would go in favor of a myxopapillary ependymoma so we must discuss what are the surgical considerations in patients with uh, intramedullary spinal cord tumors and uh, we must understand and make the patient understand that the predominant benefit of surgery for an intramedullary tumor is prophylactic and its preservation of neurological function rather than restoration of lost neurological function which is the most likely outcome of successful surgical management in these cases and and we must also understand that significant improvement of a severe or long standing neurological deficit rarely occurs after technically successful surgical ex excision and usually in clinics we do see some patients with therapeutic dilemmas asymptomatic patients who have incidental findings of intramedullary spinal cord tumors which are discovered on imaging so a degree of surgical morbidity will always be there and accompany the most successful surgical removal in cases of intramedullary spinal cord tumors and if the patient is asymptomatic without any neurological deficits there is a therapeutic dilemma which arises in these cases that should we go for surgical management of these patients or should we consider non op conservative management for the time being so a completely asymptomatic patient observation with serial clinical and radiological follow up may be an appropriate strategy for the management of these patients and this is also true for patients with conditions like neurofibromatosis or von hippel-lindau so what are the objectives of surgical management in these patients and the primary objective is long term tumor control or cure and at the same time ensuring preservation of neurological function and the most important factor influencing the surgical objective is the nature of the tumor and spinal cord interface the interface is usually assessed only through an adequate myelotomy which ex extends over the entire rostrocaudral extension of uh, the spinal cord tumor and benign tumors like ependymomas or hemangioblastomas although they are not capsulated tumors are non infiltrative and will typically exhibit a distinct tumor spinal cord interface and gross total removal may be the treatment of choice in these tumors it is very critical to establish this tumor and spinal cord interface in cases of intramedullary tumors and to decide how much surgical resection can be done safely that may also be true for a few astrocytomas but most of them do exhibit variable infiltration into the surrounding spinal cord and this is often reflected in a gradual transition zone between the tumor and the spinal cord and rarely a definitive dissection plane may be found between an astrocytoma and the normal spinal cord and the extent of tumor removal is usually uncertain and usually poorly defined in cases where a definite interface is not found so a reasonable policy for diffusely infiltrative tumors without a definite mass is biopsy whereas a gross total excision may be possible in well circumcised tumors and variable degrees of resection are possible in those tumors which are neither well circumscribed or neither diffusely infiltrative and another strategy which is useful in management is that once you have adequately exposed an intramedullary spinal cord tumor a biopsy may be performed to corroborate the surgeon's intraoperative findings and well circumscribed tumors with a clear tumor and cord interface are nearly always ependymomas whereas tumors without clear margins are usually astrocytomas and however the pathologist may not be able to adequately distinguish between those glare tumor types on the basis of intraoperative biopsy alone and hence your cross intraoperative findings are very important the importance of an intraoperative biopsy lies like if you have a clear finding of astrocytoma on frozen section it will convince the surgeon to proceed no further as it is unlikely to give significant benefit to the patient and conversely if a definite finding of ependymoma is obtained where the interface between the tumor and cord is not clear you may convince the operating surgeon to look further and check for the interface 
and proceed accordingly. So, the important surgical steps in resection of intramedullary spinal cord tumors include intubation, administration of perioperative steroids and antibiotics and usually the patient is turned into a prone position for these tumors. Prone position, all the pressure points have to be adequately padded, the eyes have to be protected all throughout the procedure and usually it's best to use a good rigid skull fixation like a Mayfield or a Sugita skull fixation for a cervical and upper thoracic region above the T6 level and a good neck flexion and head elevation may reduce the spinal curvature at these levels. It's important that sensory and motor evoke potential monitoring is used throughout the procedure. The acquired data may rarely uh, influences the surgical technique or the surgical objective but nonetheless it is useful and uh, the use of total intravenous anesthesia technique has made intraoperative monitoring much more reliable in these cases. A midline incision and subperiosteal bony dissection is made and a standard laminectomy is usually performed at the appropriate levels for these tumors and you should make it a point to extend it one level above and one level below the solid component of the tumor. You must try to preserve the facet joints as much as possible to avoid post-operative instability in these patients and it can occur delayed instability after laminectomy for intramedullary spinal cord removal and laminoplasty may be a reasonable option in selected patients. Concomitant spinal fusion is increasingly being performed particularly following multi-level cervical and thoracic laminectomy in high-risk pediatric and adolescent patients. Those who undergo more than four levels of laminectomy and tumors in the cervical thoracic and thoracolumbar junctions may benefit from concomitant spinal fusion. So, uh, this is an interoperative photograph where most glial tumors do appear with only localized spinal cord enlargement once you open the dura like is the case in this patient where we can see a localized spinal cord enlargement upon opening the dura. Uh, we must also make note of these retraction sutures by which the dura is retracted and inverted outwards to provide us with a very good interoperative field and avoids spillage of extra blood into the interoperative field into the CSF space. One important thing is that because of the eccentric location of tumor, the spinal cord may occasionally be rotated and overlying spinal cord may be thinned or transparent which is secondary to a very large or eccentrically located tumor or polar cyst lying underneath. So the exposure in most cases of uh, glial intramedullary tumors is through a midline myelotomy as is clear in this interoperative photograph through a dorsal midline myelotomy. And the dorsal midline septum, it's important to identify the dorsal midline septum as the place where you must do the myelotomy in these patients and it is the midpoint between the corresponding dorsal root entry zones which is a reliable way of finding the dorsal midline septum from where the myelotomy has to be done and it's usually also a place of convergence of veins but we must remember that all these landmarks may be disturbed because of eccentrically located uh, masses lying underneath in the spinal cord in this case in this intraoperative photograph a myelotomy has been performed it should extend throughout the rostrocordial extension of the tumor as seen so as i mentioned before it's very important to develop a tumor spinal cord interface which is a well-defined plane in cases usually of ependymomas and the we can proceed with a complete surgical resection in those cases as we can see in this intraoperative photograph there is a clear tumor and normal spinal cord plane which is exposed on dissection prep clinic dream beyond